And now we're going to talk about the Supreme Court case of Standard Oil versus the U.S., which is the first major test and decision based on the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. It was decided by the Supreme Court in 1911. It was brought by the Justice Department based on the Sherman Antitrust Act, and it accused Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller of sustaining a monopoly and restraining interstate commerce and engaging in other discriminatory practices. The charges were that it controlled the pipelines in a way that was restraint and monopolization. It had contracts that were in restraint of trade. It used unfair methods of competition, such as cutting local prices to the point where they were able to suppress competition, and they engaged in espionage. They spied on their competitors and operated bogus independent companies that weren't truly independent. That was the charge against Standard Oil. It went through a whole bunch of trials, and eventually in 1911, ends up in the Supreme Court. It ends up in the Supreme Court in front of a chief justice named Edward Douglas White. Now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with, about him, and uh, I assume you'll see why in just a second, because he's a local guy who's the son of a Louisiana governor, and he became the ninth chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Born in Lafourche Parish, down in Bayou Lafourche, near where New Iberia and Bowbridge are, uh, and he went to Tulane, uh, or what Tulane was then called, which was the University of Louisiana, which was about to be renamed Tulane. He became part of the state Supreme Court in Louisiana, then the U.S. Senate from Louisiana. And then in 1894, President Grover Cleveland made him a Supreme Court justice. Then in 1910, President William Howard Taft elevated him, promoted him to the position of Chief Justice. And the reason that's interesting is that to Democrat and a Republican, a Democrat who appoints him associate justice, then a Republican who elevates him to chief justice. The reason he's also interesting and controversial here in New Orleans is that's his statue right there. You may have seen it. It's on Royal Street in front of the Louisiana State Supreme Court building right across the street from Brennan's restaurant, the 400 or 500 block of Royal Street, standing there in front of the imposing court building uh, right in the middle of the French Quarter. And there's a movement to take down his statue there, mainly because he was in the majority in Plessy v. Ferguson, the horrible decision that enshrined segregation in the law of the land in the 1890s. Um, he also was sort of maybe a Confederate soldier. He was 16 when he was in college. When the war happened, he wanders back to Louisiana, joins a local militia, never fights officially in the Confederate, uh, the Army of the Confederacy, but does support the Confederacy. So there's a move, understandable, to take down his statue. But history is a complex thing. And I always try to complexify issues, including when it comes to statue and monument removal. Because even though he was part of the 8-1 majority in Plessy, uh, on what we now know is the wrong side of Plessy with uh, seven other justices, but he has a complex legacy on the court. He wrote the decision upholding uh, the act that mandates a eight hour workday for railway employees. And especially when we're talking about race, he wrote the decision that invalidated the, uh, what are known as the grandfather clauses, invalidated the clauses uh, that said that whites didn't have to pass a literacy test if they had any grandparent who had voted. But blacks, most of whose grandparents were slaves and didn't vote, the grandfather clause said they couldn't vote unless uh, they passed a literacy test. And uh, Edward Douglas White, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, not only 
voted in favor of, but wrote the decision that invalidated those grandfather clauses that restricted the rights of freed slaves and uh, blacks to vote, uh, saying that it was repugnant to the 15th Amendment and therefore null and void. And also, to add to the complexity, he writes the decision against Standard Oil as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. In writing the decision for the court, for the majority of the court, ruling against Standard Oil and saying that it had an unfair monopoly, Chief Justice White articulated what became known as the rule of reason. He basically said, possession of a monopoly isn't per se illegal. And acts such as variable pricing or exclusive contracts, they're not necessarily uh, illegal. But under the rule of reason, they're considered illegal if their effect is to unreasonably restrain trade. In his decision, White made no reference to, didn't try to measure or calculate the harm done to consumers by Standard Oil's monopoly. In fact, as we said, prices had drifted down on kerosene and other oil products. So it was hard to show a direct harm to consumers by the fact that Standard Oil then had a monopoly. What he instead focused on was the abusive conduct to competitors. In other words, even if they didn't directly harm consumers, they tried to restrain trade. They were anti-competitive. They tried to stop competitors from getting into the market. As he wrote, the very genius for commercial development and organization, which was manifested from the beginning, meaning by Standard Oil, soon begot an intent and a purpose to drive others from the field and to exclude them from their right to trade. It was a huge case. It becomes you know, headline all over the point, all over the country. Once again, you have that octopus metaphor, Supreme Court kills standard oil octopus. You see it in the cartoon there. And as the court wrote, the evidence is in fact absolutely conclusive that the standard oil company charges excessive prices where it meets no competition, and that on the other hand, where there is competition, where it's active, it frequently cuts prices to a point that leaves no profit to the competitor. And so in the end, uh, in a very decisive uh, uh, opinion written by Chief Justice Ed Edward Douglas White of Tulane, uh, Standard Oil is broken up. And what they do is they break it up into many, many pieces. Uh, it becomes, uh, as you can see, SO. SO, uh, you're not old enough to remember SO, but some of us remember SO, and SO, E-S-S-O, -S actually sounded like the initials, Standard Oil, SO. It eventually changes its name to Exxon, then merges with Mobile, which was another offshoot uh, and so all of these companies spin out of Standard Oil and uh, when the Supreme Court breaks them up. And thus we have both the rule of reason and a decision of the Supreme Court that says you don't have to harm consumers. It's enough that you're harming competitors. And this is something that we'll see in US v. Microsoft, and we're seeing today in things like the antitrust actions that are being considered and are being taken against Google and Facebook and Amazon. So antitrust is not just a part of history. We're living that history now.